All right, you have your Bibles with you. I want to uh, send you to a few passages to hold on to, and we're going to read through Genesis chapter 2 first, if you want to find your place there. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18. So Genesis chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 18. And last but not least, John chapter 15. So I'll go through those again. Genesis chapter 2, Proverbs 18, and John chapter 15. Just put little markers there somewhere so you know you can get there when we, when we go there. We're opening with um, Genesis chapter 2, and it's verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Let's read this together, all right? It is not good that man should be alone. Let's try that one more time. It is not good that man should be alone. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. We're going to go to uh, John chapter 15 a little later, so... Uh, You can wait on that one, but hold your place there. It's interesting that as we go through the book of beginnings and uh, the creative work that God was doing, after each creative work, God says it's good. God created uh, light. He said it's good. God created, you know, the heavens and the earth. It's good. Uh, God creates uh, the animals. God, he just goes along and everything is, is good. It's good. It's good. And then God creates man. And God says in verse 18 there, it is not good that man should be alone. In the midst of all that God is saying is good, and this is prior to sin, prior to the fall of mankind, God says it's not good that man should be alone. This was before the fall had entered. Uh, It is is, uh, God saying, Adam, you're not complete yet. You need community. You need friendship. And this shows us that although our deepest problems are sin and idolatry, our first problem that God identified was social isolation. The very first problem that God identified with us was social isolation. Therefore, even today in in the world, in society, the proverb God uh, gave to to us out out of chapter 18, verse 1, the man who isolates himself, he he breaks out against all sound judgment for his life. As we look through the Bible, friendship is a whole Bible theme throughout the Bible. And I'm going to walk you through that real quickly. The Bible tells the story of of creation uh, fracturing and uh, of the ultimate restoration of, of true friendship and friendship With God, God wanted us to have the kind of friendship that he initially established with Adam and with Eve. He wanted to restore that after the fall of man. And so friendship becomes kind of a thematic thing throughout Scripture. In the beginning, Adam and Eve enjoyed the fullness of relationship with God. But then they sinned. We read in in Genesis chapter 3, we read that of the sin and the fall of mankind, chapter 3, verse 8, and we find that Adam was, was hiding and, is, and, and Eve is hiding. And we have all been hiding from God behind a fig leaf ever since. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. We are broken and we require assembly. The ability to form friendships, to have healthy relationships and friendships is broken because of sin, because there are requirements for that. Uh, faithfulness and loyalty and all those kinds of things that are broken uh, in, in sin. And as a result of that, we are in need of, of restoration. We're in need of healing. And God wants to restore true relationship and friendship. He wants to restore uh, for the first of all, the first relationship that God wants to, to restore in terms of friendship is the relationship that God has with man. God wants to be your friend. Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to be your friend. It's shocking, right, that God wants to be your friend? God really does want to be your friend. He wants to restore the, the friendship, the, the relationship that he enjoys, 
Uh, periodically throughout Scripture, we read about people like Enoch and Noah. Uh, the Hebrew expression uh, used there, walked with God, was, a, was an expression about deep uh, and enduring friendship. It was said that, that Enoch walked with God, that Noah walked with God, and, and as an expression of, of them having this, this ongoing relationship that was, that was so good. I love the story of Enoch. It's not very big. It's just like Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. You know, it was just one of those things. It's like he, got, he just heads out with God. They're just having this great conversation and God just says, why don't we just finish this in heaven? Come on up. It was an intimate kind of friendship and relationship. Uh, we read about it in Genesis 5, 24, the other relationship, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 with Noah. Abraham was called a friend of God. A friend of God in Isaiah 41, verse 8. Moses spoke with God, it says, face to face as a man speaks with a friend. In Ezekiel, or uh, uh, Exodus, I'm sorry, chapter 33, verse 11. He drew near God drew near to all of those who called upon his name, who, who practiced true faith, who came to him, worshiping him in spirit and truth. God drew near and he wants to restore first that friendship, relationship, that intimacy that he wants to have with mankind. Jesus came and, and he became a great friend of sinners befriending all who trust and followed him. And, and he came to, to lay his life down for them. It tells us in John 15, we'll read this in a moment, 13 through 15. And now all of those that he has, has befriended, he has, has brought us into community, into relationship, uh, where we are to, to extend friendship in community, and he called it the church. And one of the things that is challenging for us to think through, and we were praying about this morning, is I really believe that across the nation uh, that these gatherings that we are having like today have just become kind of event-oriented, and that the friendships that are intended that God wanted us to have are not blossoming as they should. And the ownership of that is on all of our doorsteps. It's on all of our doorsteps. Because the Bible says in order for us to have friends, we must show ourselves friendly. It's kind of like, you know, when I, when I, uh, we, Michelle and I started a small business at one point in our life and, and we had some wise counsel in, uh, and one of the guys that was, uh, you know, uh, one of the franchise uh, guys that came in to talk to us, he said, look, your business is never going to grow if you sit behind this counter and wait for people to come in. And I would say to you, your friendship is never going to go if you <laughs> grow if you sit in your chair and wait for people to come to you, right? right? The ownership is on you and on me to show ourselves friendly, to make the first invitation, the first invite, to, to ask people to join and to, to come and to be our friends. And first of all, God wants to be your friend so he can give you the capacity to be the true kind of friend that is needed for every other person on the planet. One who is loyal, one who is faithful, one who is able to come back and, and ask for forgiveness, one who, who, who is, is uh, able to forgive when, when they are hurt and wounded. That requires that God is first our friend. How many of you have been around people where you've said, they did this and they did that to me and I wrote them off, they're done. We're no longer friends, right? You know who's absent <laughs> in their heart? Jesus. Because Jesus was wounded in the house of his friends, put on the cross by those who said uh, just days ago, Hosanna to the king, how great you are, we worship you, you're great. Jesus could say, I'm writing them off. They're done, man. They put nails in my wrists and my feet. They're done. Father, don't forgive them. But there's a handful of people around the cross here who are really sad. John, my mom, other people. Forgive them. Jesus didn't do it that way, did he? And that's why God wants us first to have that friendship with him, that intimate relationship and friendship, so that we can now befriend those that, that God has surrounded us with in his community of faith. We have the ability... But do we know how to, to form those friendships? And my first question, I guess, for us is, do we, uh, are we to a place where we can acknowledge we have a friendship shortage? 
Don't raise your hand this morning, but inside, raise your hand. Do I have a friendship shortage? I'm going to raise my hand. I have a friendship shortage. I'm always looking to make more friends. It's great to have good friends in your life. Have you ever had a car that wasn't working? It's great to have a friend. Have you ever been unemployed for a short season? It's great to have good friends in your life, right? Have you, have you ever needed someone to babysit the kids in an emergency situation? Oh, it's awesome to have friends. It really is. Have you ever like wanted to go do something fun, adventurous, but you didn't want to go do it alone? Isn't it awesome to have friends? Isn't it great to have people around your life who are really friends? Now, a recent study uh, from the insurer Cigna found that most Americans report feeling lonely, left out, uh, and not known. In the age of social media, that's incredible, isn't it? The research mirrors a host of other reporting uh, commentary that's poured in about the increasing isolation of Americans. I found it interesting reading George Barna, which, which does research mostly among Christians, and a Christian uh, researcher, and their research uh, found that one in five Christians regularly or often feel lonely. One in five Christians regularly or often feel lonely. We are made by God to live in community, and more than that, uh, to, to be able to uh, be there for one another, encouraging one another, lifting one another up, praying for one another, discovering what kind of, of needs are in our community, and helping one another to, in, in our faith to walk where God would have us to walk. Christians rightly think that salvation as forgiveness of sins you know, that, that um, it has to do with our forgiveness of sins and, and our eternal life ahead of us. But it is, is more than this. Jesus gives all who trust in him the privilege of being his friend. Now we're reading out of John. If you save that place, John chapter 15, beginning at verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. God rescued us and wants to forge an intimate relationship with us. He forgives us that we might have fellowship with him the triune unity that he enjoys with the Father, the Son, uh, and the Holy Spirit enjoy a triune relationship and fellowship together. And God wants to invite us to also enjoy that relationship. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. God wants to be your friend and he, and he wants to be uh, friends with you for life. He wants to walk through the challenges that you go through. He wants to celebrate with you on the high mountain places that you find yourself at. But he warns us that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires. He rages against all wise judgment in Proverbs chapter 18. What he's saying to us is that we do not do well outside of community. It's why God wanted us in community and wants us to have friendship. We don't do well when we isolate and we separate. We turn selfish when we are isolating and trying to live life by ourselves. Our self becomes more important than the rest of the community. And we live very selfishly. We are no longer effective for the kingdom of God because Decisions are being made that center around what's in it for me. God said that's not good. In community, they're going to call you out for being selfish. When we are isolated, we make bad decisions. I think I should do this. No advisors, no counsel in our life, no one to raise red flags. We make decisions that are detrimental to us that move us in the wrong direction. But in community, we have people who say, wait a minute, did you think about this? 
Did you pray about it? What do you think God would say about that? When we isolate, we tend to lay blame. We tend to justify decisions and things that are going on. But when we are in community, we are called out for that. And we are challenged. In community, there's wisdom. There's the wisdom council that is all around us. I love, one of the things I loved about the church is the, the seasoned Christians that were always around my life who had been through the things that I was going through. And they were just such an encouragement that you can weather this storm. We weathered this storm. Their marriages had been through what my marriage was going through. Their financial situations looked like my financial situations at one time in their life. Their, their hopes, their, their dreams, and their desires had experienced some of the same challenges, tearing and ripping and, and discouraging things that mine were experiencing. And I had people to go to, to counsel with, to ask for advice and encouragement. I remember we made a, a, a major decision, you know, regarding what we would do to save up for our future. We had people there that we could talk to in the church advisors who were doing some of the same things we were thinking about doing, who could say, here are the pros and the cons. Here are the things you should think through. Here's a better way to do it. Here's some of the mistakes we made when we first got started. Don't make those mistakes. Accountability. There's wonderful accountability in the community of, of faith believers. We're, we're missing for a while. I, that's another thing I love about the smaller local church. You are noticed when you're missed, right? You're noticed. Now, we, we were in a church um, in Las Vegas at Canyon Ridge. When we first started at that church, I was just one of eight, uh, 11 pastors on staff. And when I first started in my position at that church, the, the church was around 3,300. Over the next four years or so, it grows to about 6,000. So I want to tell you something about a church that big. We didn't know who was missing. <laughs> we had no idea. You know, there could be families that uh, were whole families that were missing for eight or ten weeks. We did not know it. The numbers came in the same for the 11 o'clock service, for the 9 o'clock service, for the Saturday 6 p.m. service. All of these numbers kept coming in looking about the same, so we didn't know when people were missing. Unfortunately for you, I know when you're missing. Your family knows when you're missing, right? Your family. Hey, we always sit at the same place. And I happened to notice that this time around, um, there was a lot of free space by me. And I missed you. There's accountability that takes place inside the community of faith, and that's the way that God intended it. He wants there to be accountability. He wants us to answer hard questions. And, and to be challenged in our walk with him. Love and acceptance is in the community. I love the fact that my kids grew up in church and they felt loved, they felt accepted. And, you know, that their only resource or refuge was not the school. No matter what that was happening at the school and what identity they were being given there, bullied, challenged, you know, um, had a bad month, week, year, uh, you know, bad sixth grade, bad seventh grade, whatever it might have been. At church, they were heroes. They were loved. They were encouraged. They were known by their name. They were embraced by people. They were welcomed into their home. They were loved on. And I love that about the church community. We were loved and were accepted. And then finally, uh, inside the community, we find help and we find encouragement. When we go through challenges, we find help and we find encouragement. When I first uh, went to, I, I took a, uh, a position on, uh, my first staff position was volunteer, and I was working at uh, Victory Assembly of God in Phoenix. And uh, not, not for pay, but uh, I was working at another job and then working there. And so my job, my company, um, they, they went on strike, and I couldn't cross the picket line. And so for three, four weeks, I'm completely out of work. I'm applying everywhere. It was a difficult time. There wasn't a lot of job openings. 
And my church family, man, I would come to church and they would have, you know, a box of groceries. Here's some food for you. How are things going for you? You know, somebody might slip a $20 bill in my pocket. And I was like, ah, you don't need to do that. And, you know, all throughout that process, God was taking care of me through church family members who loved me and cared for me and were there to help in time of need. Help and encouragement. So quickly, we're going to close out by talking about the ingredients that are necessary. So if you haven't taken notes at this point, take some notes. The ingredients that are required to put together lasting friendships. The title of this message was Friendships, Some Assembly Required. Uh, we do require some assembly to have healthy relationships. And so the first one here is self-awareness. Self-awareness. Self-awareness helps us a lot in forming friendships. We need, to, we need to know us. Stop lying to ourselves. We need to get an honest picture of us in the mirror and in God's word, right? How does my breath smell? All right, I'm going to go make some friends. Self-awareness. Uh, one, of, one of my early lessons in self-awareness I, we had moved to a uh, new community, and um, I didn't know anyone here. My dad had taken the church in this community, and I was starting school. And I was walking to school every day, uh, and it, was, it wasn't very far from our house. just about five blocks, five, six blocks. And I'm walking to school, and there were groups of kids at different places as I'm walking to school along the sidewalk, like groups of four and six and 10, you know, just people that were like gathering together in the morning just to say hi before they went into to class. And I was intimidated by these groups because I didn't know anyone. And I felt like everybody, you know, when you're the new person, everybody's watching you. So I had no idea what was going on with the expression of my face. And uh, so uh, this went on for a few weeks and I passed a group. I had the uh, same kind of group gathering uh, one, one particular morning and this girl, Peggy Sandoval, she stepped out of the group and she said, maybe you'd make some friends if you put a smile on. I didn't realize that the fear of interacting with these groups had caused me to have an unwelcoming look on my face. What does your face look like? <laughs> I didn't know until Peggy Sandoval told me. And Peggy became one of my first friends because she told me the truth, right? Yes. Have self-awareness. The second thing is be an active listener. You know, um, years ago when I was in, in seminary, um, Dr. Thomas Matthews talked about uh, the importance of us being active listeners as uh, ministers as pastors. He said, everybody in your church is a, a story and you need to learn how to read them. You need to learn how to read their story. They all have a story. Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. You are our epistles written on our, in our hearts, known and read of all men. Clearly you are an epistle. An epistle is, is uh, the word for letter of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. I have learned to love human beings, behavioralism, and, and read, reading of stories of, of fellow human beings. I love people. And I have learned to love to, to hear their stories. And I, I love to hear you tell me, how life has been for you, the things that have gone on, what's made you, you. I really love to hear people's story. And the thing that I've found is if you become an active listener, and, and that becomes more important to you than you telling your story and everything else, you get to hear some beautiful stories. And at some point, people will ask you about your story, and then that's fine. Tell them your story. But I love to listen to other people tell the stories of their life. And what I've found in doing this is it really opens up friendship early. When people feel like they can talk to you and you're an active listener, you listen to what they're saying, you hang on the words of what's going on in their life, and, and you, you engage with their story, they love to tell their story. Now it's written out here on them. 
to read. They just want to read it to you. They want you to be able to hear their story. But it also brings incredible understanding if we are good, active listeners. We make judgments about first impressions with people. That person is, is cranky all the time. That person is unhappy. That person's bitter or whatever. But when you hear people's story, it brings grace, doesn't it? Yeah. You're like, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea what you went through. That is unbelievable. How are you even standing where you're standing having come through what you've come through? Praise God that, you, that he was faithful and brought you through such a difficult and horrible experiences and you are standing in his house today. That's awesome. That is so awesome. I love to hear people's stories. We need to practice being active listeners. The third one is to be compassionate. Jesus was compassionate. He had compassion wherever he was. And people who are compassionate, the, the wonderful thing about people who are compassionate is they're not easily wounded or offended. They're hard to get rid of, <laughs> people who are compassionate. They, they understand their own story. They know the difficulties and challenges of life in general. They know the aches and pains of, of life and all the stresses and difficulties and challenges that are going on. And they are compassionate towards you as a result of understanding themselves better. And they're hard to push out of your life. They're hard to offend. They're hard to wound. Because they are compassionate and they understand what goes on with every human being. They see their own faults and mistakes, their hurts. Their, they understand that every person given time uh, is going to hurt uh, someone, maybe even them. And uh, they also understand that they have intentionally and unintentionally hurt a lot of people in their lifetime. But they also understand that God forgives. And they understand that the obligation as a result of being forgiven is to forgive others. And so they have compassion. And finally, the last one is, we need to practice open friendship circles. We had our, our uh, team night uh, not too long ago. They asked me to do a little 10-minute um, segment on uh, kind of a master class on evangelism. And this is one of the things we talked about, about opening friendship circles. And my first question to everyone in the room was, do, do you, are you in a clique? And uh, so that, you know, you, you feel comfortable, yes, you are. All of you are in a clique. You're all in cliques. You're in closed friendship circles, all of us. It's natural. We all do it. There are people that we have interaction with on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. And um, we are not, uh, you know, regularly opening up and forming new friendships. What we're regularly doing is... Uh, existing in the clique. We are regularly meeting with certain people. We're regularly talking to certain people. We're regularly going out with certain people. We're regularly involved in, and, and that circle as we get older, unfortunately, gets smaller and smaller. So you, some of you who are here today, your clique is really tiny. You're like, the clique is me and my wife. Or uh, <laughs> the clique is me and my wife and our next door neighbor. Um, but we are all uh, subject to being caught up in a clique. And the danger is that if we stay there, it's going to be destructive to us, to the other members there. We must learn to open ourselves up to new friendships, invite uh, people into our lives on a regular basis. We, we tend to get comfortable. We have certain people in our lives that we want to interact with. And God is challenging us to make new friends. What is that going to require? For some of us, you know, it, it may require getting involved in some things that we haven't been involved in before. Knocking on some neighbor's doors, uh, go, joining a bowling league, putting ourselves in a situation where we're going to be forced to meet new friends. This happens to you when you change jobs. You go somewhere else. The people that you left behind, you still know them, and you might even email them once in a while, but now suddenly a new circle of relationships is starting to happen. And it's something that God wants to take place in our lives on a regular basis for the purposes of evangelism expanding our friendship circles, letting everybody know they are welcome to be our friends. Doesn't mean that you're going out every night with thousands of people, you know, 
but it just means that you are welcoming and open to every person that passes your way that God sends your way, or that you are expanding your circles out towards, right? I want to invite uh, our worship team to get ready to come back. What would life look like for us if we did two things as a result of what we're talking about today? First of all, accept God's invitation to be his friend and let him be our friend. He said it's not good for you to be alone. And secondly, if we would get deeply involved in community. What would our church look like if we did those two things alone? We invited God first to be our friend, opened up to intimate relationship and friendship with him. And secondly, we started getting, uh, instead of just having these event gatherings, we started being friends. Instead of me having to put a name tag on for you to know me, uh, you would know me and my habits, my personality, my Uh, my likes and dislikes, and and we would know each other a lot better than we do right now. What would life look like in our church if that started happening? What would life look like in our community if that started happening? If we started opening up to new friendships and relationships, if we became uh, committed to being self-aware, compassionate, if, if we invited open circles of friendship, and wanted to be friends with all that God placed around our life, what would change and what would life look like? I want to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to pray over you, and as I do, Michelle's coming to get ready for us to receive communion. There's probably not a better Sunday that we could be receiving communion together than when we're talking about friendship. Because that's what this is all about, coming to the Lord's table. We all have that in common. We all were sinners saved by God's grace. And he made a sacrifice for all of us. Father, I thank you for every person that's in this room. And the first challenge to all of us is that have we allowed you to be our friend? Have we made you our friend and invited you to to have an intimate relationship with us and to walk with you intimately? And so God, the first thing we want to do is make you our very best friend and invite you to do that. And so we're asking you, Lord, to be Lord and leader over our lives, every aspect of our life. Lord, let us look at the church differently. It's not just an event that happens on Sunday for an hour and a half. But God, this is the community of faith, um, believers, friends that you've sent into our life for this moment. In this community are people who can encourage us, um, give us advice, hold us accountable. Lord, let us see things completely differently and open ourselves up to the friendship that you have brought into our life in Jesus' name.